originality is a word one hears often applied to music and the other arts. But this is a problem because there are various kinds of originality and they're not all equal. I can easily think of various original special effects that could be incorporated into a piece, but that doesn't mean that the music would be of any interest. Here are a couple of examples. Imagine a violin filled with olive oil. I thought it would sound very interesting, and I don't think a violinist would want to do this to their precious instrument. Imagine two tubists sitting side by side, and each one has to sing while the other one plays their part. Well, tubas are pretty loud, so the chance of an untrained voice making a lot of difference here is not great. I doubt anyone has ever done these things, so they are original, but the key question is not whether anyone has ever done it before, but whether the result is musically interesting. Both of these might be funny, but the humor would not last long, and I doubt anyone would enjoy them for their musical impact. Originality without musical significance usually just distracts the listener, weakening the overall effect. Really expressive originality is much rarer and is not easy to achieve. Here are a couple of examples of musically significant originality. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, apart from being the first symphony to include a choir in the last movement, also does something very novel in the first movement, in measure 120 and following, where we have a quiet tutti. That is to say, all the sections of the orchestra are playing together quietly. Listen. Normally, in orchestration from that time, a tutti was for loud music, and the composer who wrote a quiet tutti was just inept. But Beethoven realized that a quiet tutti could have a powerful character of its own, and he arranged the other aspects of the music to reinforce that. For example, here, the repetitions of the motive create a kind of obsessive effect. So his real innovation here was not just a quiet tutti, but finding the character where it was appropriate. There are several similar passages later in this movement, like the beginning of the development section. Another example. Wagner's mature operas resemble nothing before them, both in sheer duration and in their uninterrupted musical continuity. Since he was often dealing with mythological gods and superhuman heroes, the gigantic stale was appropriate. In both of these cases, the composer achieved a more potent, expressive kind of music. This is the only kind of originality that's of real interest. So, is originality a criterion for good music? Well, if so, how is Bach original, or Brahms? These were wonderful composers, but it's hard to think of anything significant that Bach invented. Fugues existed before Bach, as did cantatas, keyboard suites, and so on. While Bach sometimes used less common versions of these forms, that's not what gives Bach's music its incredible power. What sets off Bach from the previous composers who used these forms was mainly the richness and the intensity of his music. Some of the great Bach organ fugues achieve a cumulative dramatic intensity like nowhere music I can think of. Brahms, similarly, has never been known for any special effects or obvious inventions, but his music is deeply emotional. Brahms usually used familiar forms, but he always molded them to fit his musical ideas, as any good composer would. But Brahms did not invent the symphony or the concerto or the violin sonata. Nonetheless, his music in these pieces is very expressive, and he does have a strong, recognizable personal style. In fact, originality is a fairly recent criterion. You will search a long time for anyone who, in their time, described Mozart's music or Schubert's as original. What distinguished these composers was the depth of their craftsmanship, their expressive richness, and once again, a very personal voice or style. Sibelius is another interesting example. He's usually considered a very conservative composer. I will soon be doing a lesson about Sibelius's harmony, and we'll see again and again how he achieves a very distinctive sound using quite familiar means. Another point about originality. Striking originality has consequences that needs to be followed up. Probably the best known example of this is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. It's hard for us to imagine since the work is now so familiar, but when that dramatic pause arrives in measure 21, that hell G in the violins must have sounded like a mistake to people hearing it for the first time. Listen. <laughs> If we listen attentively, it does leave us a bit puzzled. Why? If it resembles nothing else in the immediate context, why would just one instrument hold that note while all the others stop? It's an oral riddle. 
The answer comes when, in the recapitulation, he triggers an oboe solo. Listen. This oboe solo is the only moment in the whole movement where the powerful rhythmic momentum is replaced with a much more introspective, melancholy character. So now we see the real purpose of that stop in measure 21. When it recurs, it makes the arrival of the oboe solo stand out even more. It's just a new continuation after an interruption that's already attracted our attention the first time. This gives it a deeper significance than if the oboe just arrived in the recapitulation with no preparation. This also demonstrates how expressive originality must make, make, make sense in terms of how the human mind operates. Beethoven depends on the fact that the first pause in measure 21 is very salient, so as to make its recurrence a sort of answer to the previous question. The point of all this is that originality is much more complicated than some people think. It's often used in a superficial sense, or as a way to young composers they have to do something weird, or a study of expressive potency is not mentioned. But without it, originality itself is meaningless. And in fact, not all great composers are original in this deeper sense. What they do all share is a clearly recognizable personal voice and strongly expressive music.